Yes? Yes. All right. Hi. It's lovely to see all these familiar faces. I've been traveling around the world so much that uh, I don't know which way is up, but to be here and to see people that I know uh, is, a, is a pleasure. You know, in hearing about your format, uh, where you plan your own day, direct your own learning, I was just blown away. I thought, what a great group. Um, just a, a phenomenal approach, and we don't get that everywhere we go. Uh, I bet you uh, appreciate what it's like to be in, in Minnesota, in a place where there's so many open-minded people. Today we're going to bring you some of the best ideas from around the world uh, and celebrating learning places. And being in a building like this today uh, is a really good opportunity uh, to do that. We can look outside to the right, we can look inside to that wonderful common area. Uh, the building is really set up to engage us creatively. And we've been designing uh, creative learning spaces around the world for a good couple of decades. And we found that in all the places we've worked, four to three countries, that mostly we learn about the same. Uh, we're uh, amazed at how many commonalities we have. We're all singing the same song. But there are some differences, and those differences are also uh, very important. You know, just uh, a few weeks ago, I was in Bangkok with uh, Lewis. Lewis, can you stand up? He is one of our designers at FNI in the uh, Twin Cities area, and Lewis and I, uh, Went to Bangkok together. We're planning a uh, new science research university and co-located science high school, a new campus just south and east of Bangkok. And in it, we, uh, we facilitated five days of workshops. And on the first afternoon, I proposed a session much like the one you have today, where we'd have little peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning breaks and discussions. And there was also an interactive exercise where people were asked to go online at their various tables and look at MIT uh, Media Lab and their 27 di different research centers and decide which ones were most relevant to them and report out on it. Well, the exercise failed. <laughs> when we tried to do peer-to-peer -peer sessions, people didn't really talk to each other. They were waiting for me to tell them, what do we do now? And when I asked them to go online and research MIT Media Lab, they didn't have enough direction. They kept saying, what are we really supposed to do? It was, it was kind of amazing. Uh, I, I, I was shocked. I've done this exercise many times before, uh, or similar ones, but it didn't work well in that particular <coughs> setting. Uh, what did work is we were taking some breaks. Uh, this is me doing tree pose there, <laughs> leading them in some, in some uh, stretches to get people uh, used to being with each other so we could start working as a team. And that was something to build up. And by the end of the day, we were starting to get going well. Um, what also worked for them was uh, this discussion of 20 different learning modalities. They got that right away. And in fact, the head of the high school, Dr. Tung Chai, after seeing this short presentation, said, OK, I get that. They'll be the criteria for our new high school, which I thought was, was interesting. So I'm going to quickly go through those. Uh, one is independent study. You know. Many of our schools are set up to be a lot of good lecture spaces, but they don't necessarily support all the other kinds of learning that we know are happening, like independent study, like peer-to-peer -peer tutoring. This is one of our schools, International School of Brussels. This is a new temporary building that we, uh, we renovated a three-story building while we're building a new high school, which is just about to open. And you can see how important the peer-to-peer -peer interaction is, team collaboration. Harbor City and International School in Duluth. And one-on-one -on -one learning. Lecture-based learning. This is Christo Ray School here, and uh, Dr. Christine Malloy is here, who is the founding principal of Christo Ray, uh, of a school where um, lecture is still done well. This is Emily, the literature teacher. <laughs> Project-based learning. Uh, this is a shot from a High School for Recording Arts, and we have at least two people. Uh, Tony Simmons, the program director, and Dr. Wayne Jennings, who is the uh, superintendent of Har uh, High School for Recording Arts. Project-based learning is very important there. Kids learn a tremendous amount through their experience with recording. Learning with mobile technology. This is the first laptop school in India, and we opened it 11 years 
years ago. Uh, in fact, my partner, Prakash Nair, is in New Delhi now, planning a whole series of additional schools. It changed everything, uh, that uh, kids actually can use laptops everywhere. Distance learning, uh, just last night, uh, I was doing some of that at nine o'clock at night. Lewis and I were conducting one of our weekly uh, WebEx video conferences with our partners in Bangkok. And in fact, it was a form of distance learning because we were sharing a whole series of design patterns with them. And you had people from seven, several different offices in Thailand who were taking notes and listening, and we were able to sketch back and forth together. Internet-based research, student presentations, Idea Academy in Apple Valley. It's a uh, renovation that we did, uh, oh, about a decade ago. And uh, Chris Fielding here in the back was the one who picked the colors for that project, which uh, <laughs> uh, really helped make a, a small, low-cost renovation sink, which is a point I wanted to make that great design and great learning spaces are not about spending a lot of money. Well, we love this center, the Anderson Center. I mean, it's a gorgeous building, and the Cristo Rey building is a gorgeous building and delightful. But we've also done many, many very low-cost renovations, which really change your space. In fact, a building is a form of technology. You all leverage technology. And today we're going to talk about different ways you can use your space to leverage that technology more strongly. Performance-based learning. And I, I'd say High School for Recording Arts has that one now. Uh, there's nothing more exciting to me than going to high school for recording arts on a Friday afternoon for their Friday pick-me-up and seeing the kids perform. It is amazing how it connects people up. Roundtable discussions. Um, you know, classrooms can be really valuable, but sometimes we need spaces that are a little smaller than classrooms. They're good for roundtable discussion rather than 25 kids and a lecture. Interdisciplinary learning. Uh, I like this shot from Twin Beach in Australia where you see kids using traditional media and also uh, you see them using high-tech media as well. It uh, reminds me of what, what's been happening in uh, my own studio lately. My daughter, Jackie Fielding, is uh, home for just a few days before she heads to Chicago and she's been making quilts and also making videos all at the same time. <laughs> she's using iMovie and then she's using a sewing machine. It's wonderful to see that kind of interdisciplinary mixed media uh, thing happening. Naturalist learning. Uh, this is one of uh, our schools we consulted with in Long Island, Bridgehampton. Where they actually tell a story about uh, Native Americans here and the connection between the beans and the pumpkins uh, and the sun. And they created a space where they can learn outside. Social emotional learning, so important. Art based learning. One of our projects in Indonesia is an IB school for 1,400 kids. And the common areas are used in a lot of different ways. Uh, in this case, art, and it was very important that that space be resourced so you had sinks in it, you had storage, you had room darkening. So sometimes it's used for a lecture, sometimes it's used for art, sometimes it's used for informal gatherings. Storytelling, uh, we're back in Delhi. And design-based learning in Australia. And team teaching and learning, this is in, uh, in Gainesville, Florida. Uh, most of the schools we do don't have classrooms with teachers having their own desks there. Rather, we create teacher collaboration spaces so that teachers can work together. We know that out student outcomes improve when teachers are collaborating and play-based learning. So I'm going to read off each one of these. And when I do, stand up for the ones that are most important to you. And that means you get to stand up five times. So pick the top five. And Kathy over here, she is our media coordinator from Fielding Air International. And Lewis will just take a rough count. <laughs> okay, so we'll get a little bit of data. We may share with you later at another time or, or through the, the uh, uh, wiki or tweet later. So uh, if independent study is one of your top five, please stand up. A lot of independent folks here. <laughs> We even have an attorney with us, Steve Yock, who uh, uh, believes that independent study is important. Thank you. OK, sit down. Peer tutoring. If this is one of your top five, please stand up. Ah, there's some folks who understand the value of uh, peer tutoring. Great. Thank you. OK, sit down. Team collaboration. Please stand up. It's one of your top five. Oh my gosh. Now, 
Wayne, why are you not standing? <laughs> Bad tea. Oh, okay. I thought it was a statement that you didn't want to collaborate. <laughs> All right, please sit down. One-on-one um, -on -one learning. <clears throat> All right, great. You know, it's amazing how, how everyone's different. Uh, Lecture-based learning. Good, well that makes me feel okay since I'm delivering a lecture. <laughs> if no one stood up, I would feel unimportant. <laughs> right. Project-based learning. Wow, astounding. It looks like we only have maybe one person, two people. Oh, come on, Louis. <laughs> oh, he's taking notes. Three people. It's almost unanimous. Learning with mobile technology. All right, great, thank you. Um, distance learning. All right. Internet-based research. So there's none of us who doesn't do it. I guess the question is whether it's in your top five. Okay. Student presentation. <clears throat> yeah. You know, one of our schools at Harbor City, uh, a high school, kids do 150 presentations before they graduate. Performance-based learning. Hey, Tony's not standing up. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Round table discussion. All right, we've got some good discussers here. Uh, interdisciplinary learning. Even with a bad knee, Wayne is standing up. <laughs> Naturalist learning. All right, that's actually, a, yes, sit down. I'm surprised, you know, I've been a lot of places in the world where this was number one. You know, sometimes shocked. Even in the Arctic Circle, we've actually worked in none of it. Ask the Inuit what's most important to them, being outside on the land. <laughs> Social emotional learning. Hmm. There we have the head of the department in education. Uh, Christine Malloy, who acknowledges that social emotional learning is uh, in her top five. Art based learning. We got some artists in the group. I didn't know that about you, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> Storytelling. A great tradition. Design based learning. Mm -hmm. Okay. Team learning and teaching. Yeah. Play-based learning. Woohoo! <laughs> well, great, thank you. I love this part. I love seeing everyone sit up and stand. All right, part two. Uh, be, I'm going to share some case studies, and we're going to focus a little bit more on smaller projects and renovations. Um, but before that, I'm going to introduce just a few key design patterns. And speaking of design patterns, I brought a book. It's called The Language of School Design, and it has 35 different design patterns, things we've learned around the world that people do over and over again that seem to really make your building technology work. And I'm going to give out a copy to whoever does the best yoga pose later on in the session. <laughs> so some of you have an advantage there. <laughs> All right. So a few introductory patterns uh, would be campfires, watering holes, caves, and light. And actually, uh, I, I got this idea, uh, Prakash, my partner, and I got this idea from Dr. David Thornburg, who sometimes works with us as an educational consultant. He was writing about primordial learning modalities 10 years ago, not about spaces, not about architecture. And he said, you know, if you go back far in time and you think about how people learned, uh, they, one way they learned was around a campfire through storytelling. You'd have a sage, uh, and, and I, when I think of a sage, I think of uh, Wayne James. I think of him as the uh, grandfather of progressive education here in uh, Minnesota talking and sharing and people listening. It's an oral tradition. It's basically a lecture. 
very important learning modality. And you've also got watering hall space. So what happens, some people are sitting around the campfire at night, but they don't all listen well. And what we found, because we do, uh, sometimes we do same-sex schools, for example, where we've been uh, working for St. George's School, which is a boys' IB school uh, in Vancouver in the last couple of years, we found frequently boys don't listen as well as girls, especially in the 10 years, first 10 years. Actually, research shows that their hearing is not as good uh, for the first 10 years. So some people at that campfire, campfire setting, they're not listening as well. They're a little fidgety, they're a little distracted. But the next day at the watering hole when they're hanging out and their friend, Jackie, starts telling them about what they were hearing last night, then they become engaged through that social emotional kind of connection. And they start hearing through Jackie's voice, what is it that moved them that a storyteller was telling yesterday or a lecturer was telling yesterday. And then through that informal watering hole mode, that might become very exciting to them. So that watering hole mode is just as important as the campfire or the lecture mode. And this building really celebrates that well. Actually, it's just filled with watering hole modes. <laughs> then there's cave space. Um, I think all of us know that a lot of real work happens by yourself. We may come together and collaborate and be stimulated and share ideas. But when do you get work done? When you're in your own space. Some people I know get their work done while they're driving in the car. Um, other people get it done actually while they're in the shower. <laughs> their mind's really working. A lot of people get it done at a computer, some late at night. I get a lot of work done walking around Lake Harriet early in the morning. It's just things are going through, things are coming together in my head. So um, cave space is really about not just an architectural space, but it's a space you create where you can reflect, uh, you can absorb knowledge, and you can synthesize. This particular image is from one of our schools in, uh, outside of Jakarta, where you have a, a lovely central cafe, but you also have these distributed dining areas where the learning keeps happening uh, in this kind of watering hole space. Avalon School. Uh, Avalon has moved since then. This is a 12-year-old photo, but their first building, uh, this is a kind of campfire mode. And interestingly, just as you direct your own learning here, those kids, through a democratic process, have a lot of control in managing the school. <coughs> we are at, at MIT. Uh, this is the status center, and you see a watering hole mode. You've got technology, you've got people working individually and collaborating. One of the most popular areas at MIT. World of work, uh, our kids eventually are going to get jobs, and what better place than a place like Google? And there you see a kind of watering hole mode, also where learning is made explicit, where people can share what they're thinking on a wall. Uh, and here we are at IDEO, uh, the same kind of thing. It's a sort of watering hole and work and collaborative mode. Here's a cave space. I was in. Um, at the Esplanade Library in Singapore a number of years, and I noticed this young woman sitting in a windowsill. And I'm sure that space was not actually designed as a cave space, but you could just tell by the expression on her face that she was in that kind of reflective cave mode. And she had found this wonderful area with a view to, view to the outside. So we have an opportunity to create spaces like that in our buildings. Uh, here we are in, uh, in Australia where cave spaces were very explicitly designed into the learning studios. And now we are back to Google, where you see they put cave spaces in, uh, and, and they're well used. And then the last learning modality uh, Thornburg talks about is that we also learn from life. So some of the most complex th things we'll ever learn, such as learning to talk or learning to walk, we learn before we get to school. Um, this is a, a, a shot at Harbor City International where the kids at about 3.30 in the afternoon clean the school and the kids also serve the lunch. And actually there's a great vibe there. When, when you see them doing it, they crank the radio up. They don't seem like they're actually being forced any, to do anything. They seem very engaged. Uh, it's a great life lesson and a lot of what we learn is in fact uh, learning from life. So we're going to have a, uh, a two minute peer breakout. This is what didn't work so well in Bangkok, but I'm counting on you guys being good at this because of uh, because we're in Minnesota. And uh, I'm gonna ask you to turn to someone on your right or your left, pick a partner, you have two minutes, 
and discuss these two questions, one and two. What do you see, campfire, cave, or watering hole? Question two, how do those spatial metaphors change your thinking about learning environments? Two minutes. Which one? Yeah. I, see, I see more than just one. I see, oh, yeah. I see more than just one. I see all three. Yeah, you can see the gathering, yeah, the watering hole, the campfire. The watering hole with the, black, with the whiteboard. The and the, then this, this girl who's got her back to us is definitely in the cave. Mm -hmm. And then the uh, round tables are. Okay, what's the difference between a campfire and watering hole? Um, the campfire. Campfire is more of a discussion. Yeah. Right so like that guy's standing in the black part. You get, or you get resources or information. Okay, you roll call. <laughs> so, so the guy who's standing with the blackboard, you would say that he's like in the middle of the campfire. All right. Talking to other people. You can see the water involved from the other people, the people sitting around the table, and working together. Working together. I was thinking of all the things I see that are similar to what he was talking about, like where in my school do I have the space and that space and that space, but like we have a commons area where the fights to use it, the same groups out there. Uh, that's probably the most, most of uh, the watering holes. Well, you know what our uh, library looks like. So you've got. Uh, you got a gathering area for like lecture thing, thing or storytelling. Yep. Yep. I'm sure you have to have that. We have that. We have small spaces, you know, where we can meet, we also have some big round tables. Well, you can see it's one round table being a watering table. Right. You don't have that many caves though. We don't have very many caves. There's one round table that's back in the middle of the stacks. And then over, you know where those offices are on the side over there? There's some, um, some space over there that's smaller. But, but we don't have a lot of cave spaces. We tried to kind of put in cave spaces just with pillows or something like that. But it didn't work, you know, the custodians didn't like having those things there. Well, they got to clean up their yeah, yeah, so. But you got to watch. When the kids are by themselves, okay. you can trust them again. Can I have your attention again? Let me disappear. All right, any uh, comments on what you see? Campfire, cave, or watering hole? Any thoughts? All three. Yeah, yeah. That was a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> so you've, you've definitely got a sort of campfire lecture thing going there and a kind of a, a watering hole thing there. And the, this young lady, uh, she's actually more in a, in a cave mode. You see, in this particular case, you have kids, every uh, student has their own workstation uh, right in that space. And some of them, just like here, uh, Carl said or Scott said, hey, you can do your own thing if you want. You don't really have to follow our schedule at Australian Math and Science Academy. They have the same policy. You could be working on your own thing or listen to the lecture or not. So part three, I'm gonna go through some case studies. Uh, we're gonna start with a very low cost uh, rehab for an early childhood center. Uh, this is Shorecrest Preparatory in Florida. And you can see all the different kind of mo learning modalities going on there. Um, some of the uh, things we were thinking about, you, you had a very unusual kind of, I think it was a 60s plan. Uh, and the classrooms were small, and they were a bit rigid in their ability to configure. So what we did was uh, we opened up a lot of the spaces to each other, uh, one space to the other, one space to the common area, and we added a lot of outdoor space. In a place like Florida, this was great. Although I want to make a comment about weather. Often when we're working in a place like Minnesota or Cleveland uh, or Chicago, people will say, well, that's great what you do in Florida or what you're doing in Asia, but you know, we have a cold climate. Well, I'd like to share with you what some of our friends say, have said in, in Whitehorse, where we've worked. Um, and that is, there is no bad weather, it's just bad clothing. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, uh, rain is great, heat and humidity are great, cold weather is great, it's all great, it's life. 
<laughs> and most kids are fine with appreciating the outside, with learning outside, and uh, we as teachers or as designers can facilitate that. In some cases, it's putting some umbrellas out there, it's creating some shaded spaces, some places protected from the rain, and most importantly, it's encouraging people and helping with programming that allows for that. Anyway, that connection to outdoors had a huge impact on the success of this space. Um, we went through all sorts of details on how they teach and learn. We dug into their pedagogy and into their curriculum, and we mapped out where all the different things could happen in these tiny spaces. Um, many of you are probably familiar with curriculum mapping. It's something that's been popular for 20-some for years. I think Heidi Hayes Jacobs uh, made it famous in about uh, 1997. But in the traditional curriculum mapping that educators do, you're generally writing down what you do and where in a chart. There aren't real maps. And one of the things we like to do is actually create maps where we're doing that kind of curriculum mapping. What do you do where? And then um, talking about how we do it and when right on a floor plan. Now here you can see some before and after shots. That's a before. Here's an after. Uh, we still have inexpensive lighting. We still left the ceilings, but we change uh, the, the flooring and the colors before, after, before, after. Um, this getting some of that storage under the windows was really helpful in opening up that interior space. A lot of it was about the furniture uh, and the color and the finishes before and after. So there was a lot of clutter before. There's still a lot of stuff but organizing where you put stuff in an aesthetic way was so important. And this use of color was so important as well. Is there any specific color that you think is more beneficial? No, uh, in fact, uh, uh, Chris Fielding, uh, who's been doing colors with FNI for 30 years and I, uh, often talk about this. She's just recently been choosing colors for High School for Recording Arts and Venture Academy in Minneapolis and St. Paul. And uh, Chris just said to me the, the other night how important it is to have the whole palette in there, that there's a real use to have all the colors represented in some way. So variety is very important. And um, a lot of, there's a mythology about color. This idea that red would incite violence, that's a myth. There is a little truth in that red is hotter, and if you put paint red on a wall and the sun is out, and you paint blue on a wall next to it, and you put a thermostat on it, red will be a lot warmer tone. It will absorb more sun. Um, so there is a little, some people are affected slightly differently by colors, but using the right shades of red, the right tones of red in the right places, you can go a warmer, uh, for example, um, We had a red in here. Uh, well, uh, where was it? I know I saw a red. Ah, um, well, there's a red right over here. So this is a form of red, but it's very different from fire engine red. So variety is really important, just the way it is in, uh, in learning spaces. We don't want all classrooms and corridors. We want variety in spaces. We want variety in color as well. So today's public school, like what I'm used to seeing, is pretty much the same color all the way through. It's kind of outdated as far as exciting kids to learn. That is an inhuman factory model of schools, yeah. where we said everything should be the same. Yeah. And everyone should eat in a room with 250 kids <clears throat> at the same kind of chairs, right? Who goes to a restaurant where you know, you're lined up with 250 people in a space, uh, you know, and every chair is the same? Um, who in their house would actually create a house with a corridor with every room being the same size off the corridor <laughs> and, and being the same color? It's inhuman. It's actually not respectful of our young, of, of students' uh, rights as human beings. That's, that's how I feel strongly <laughs> I feel about it. <laughs> Another case study, uh, and then we'll take a tiny short peer-to-peer uh, -peer break again. Uh, this one is about new construction and a renovation, International School of Brussels. 
It's one of the top uh, IB schools in Europe. Uh, it's 1,500 students from age two and a half to 19 from 70 countries. And uh, if, you, if you look at this, uh, this is a part of their plan of their campus, which has been around for, oh, some 50, 60 years. Uh, one of the things we're trying to do with these new buildings is create a heart there, or a common ground quad. And this site was so tight, and it's also all historical structures, in order to fit a new high school in here, we had to take a building down here, an old three-story building, and renovate it so we have swing space to move the kids in. Uh, and they moved in and have been there for two years, and the new high school is about to open in a few months. I can't wait to go see it. Um, first thing we did is talk about how they're teaching and learning. And uh, Kevin Bartlett, who's the director of that school, had a lot to do with authoring the IB curriculum and is working on a kind of what he sees as an update to IB, which is also a bit more democratic, that uh, actually this common ground curriculum is available to, uh, to more people, uh, even if you don't join IB. Um, <coughs> right now there's uh, 14 uh, schools that are part of a coalition that are developing it. And in essence, it's about the independent learner on one side, that imagine someone in cave space, and that international citizen on the other side, or we might call it the me and the we. We diagram some 30 pages of curriculum documents into a single page here. And what it, what it was about is this really scaffolding hanging between the me and the we, and these higher order principles, such as sustainability, or innovation and productivity or pattern order, starting with that, and then you drill down. So part of sustainability are subjects like environmental sciences, economics, design, tech, and also concepts like interdependence, diversity, and social justice. Same thing here, pattern and order. One of some of the concepts are systems and organization and subjects like mathematics, physics, and chemistry. Now diagramming that I think was a real aha moment for them to see that as designers and architects, we were starting out with their curriculum. And whereas they had a lot of text to put it into a single page, was to begin to bridge the gap between words and thinking and sort of cerebral function into design. And then we, uh, we went through a kind of curriculum mapping process. Uh, and these are all their lead teachers. This is one of our, our lead educators here consulting with us. Uh, and, and that's Chris Hazelton, who was the founder of Harbor City International. And after <coughs> seven years, he left and joined FNI. Uh, and travels with us uh, to work with uh, our clients. And you can see some of the icons we use to help teachers who are not all comfortable drawing to actually map out uh, what they're doing. Sometimes we'll do a schedule analysis like this where we'll look at the way that they're currently using space and what happens if we move to what we call a learning community model. These dark olive colors show that more space is showing up. What we're doing in this change is actually becoming more efficient. Because we have more fluid spaces that can be used in a lot of different ways, you actually have a higher utilization rate. And I say that because sometimes people look at our presentation and say, that stuff all looks great, looks really expensive. Actually, the reverse is the case. Our schools are more efficient. The typical school, typical public school uh, that you were talking about, I think when you're talking about color, uh, will generally have a 65% uh, efficiency. 35% of the school uh, is on uh, other things. 22% of that will be on just circulation where no learning is happening. We'll often get it 15% more efficient where all those hallways are now becoming learning spaces. Um, here you can see this is one of the common areas, which is, uh, and there's one on each floor, it's the heart of that learning community. And you can see how kids are working individually and they're also working collaboratively. They're at a high table, which is interesting. People interact a little differently with high tables and short tables. This is a generation who's used to short conversations, tweets, uh, text rather than emails. I can stop over to someone who's sitting at a high place and just pause and interact, and it's much different than if I do this, which is more of a commitment to have a real conversation. So we find that high and low tables has a big impact, and it's something that every one of you can go and do two weeks from now. <laughs> it can't be that hard to mix up your furniture a little bit, even if some of the furniture is used. Um, here you can see uh, a girl who's creating kind of cave space inside a common area. 
and hear a teacher doing the same. She has a teacher collaboration workroom, and yet she chooses this for her office space. And I'm told she's always out there when she's not doing direct instruction. Um, you can see a, a bigger view of that. You can see how important these acoustical baffles are to allow a lot of different uh, conversations to happen there effectively. You can also see how we've used lockers actually to subdivide the space and create work surfaces instead of lining the walls with uh, metal uh, lockers. And uh, they're smaller, um, but we have hooks, so that takes care of the coats. And we're even using the stairwells as learning spaces. Uh, this is the new building, the new high school, which is just about done. It's a five-story space. And you can see how at the entry area is a space that can be used to hang out and interact, but it's also a lecture space where you can have 200 kids gather. So we're getting a kind of welcoming entry. We're getting some of this mode you're seeing at the Anderson Center. And we're also getting a lecture space out of it. This is the, uh, uh, it's a math and science collaboration area at level four. So this gets to that uh, value of interdisciplinary learning. Uh, and now you see a little view, and this, this view of the high school shows how we're dealing with some of the sustainability issues. For example, this outdoor space, which has photovoltaic panels, also becomes a place for the science labs to break out into. So it's also an outdoor experimental zone. And it's also a place for uh, exercise, for yoga. Speaking of, uh, of breaks and exercise and yoga, I'm going to skip that for a minute and just move on to this. I did see someone sleeping in the room. I'm not going to say who it was. <laughs> I hope it's not me, but it might be the ventilation. It's a little bit close in here. So I'm going to ask for a one minute uh, stretch. If everyone can stand up, unless you have a knee problem, you're excused. <laughs> now, I know there's some people in here who really know yoga, uh, and that's great. Um, <laughs> I'm a, a rank beginner, but I find a one minute stretch really helps. So we've got three poses here. On the left is warrior pose. That's the most basic. In the middle is tree pose, and over here is dancer. Uh, if you're not familiar with yoga, I'd suggest the warrior pose. Otherwise, uh, just take a pose and hold it for 90 seconds. All right, so if you're doing warrior, Reach those hands up and open your chest. And then, uh, yeah, bring your, uh, come down like this. Okay, so you feel a stretch in your legs. Your hands up like this, almost together. And let's, let's hold it for about 90 seconds. Oh, we got someone doing a tree pose there. He looks totally comfortable, too. You're not even wavering at all. Anyone trying a dancer? <laughs> yeah? Ah, hey, look over there. That's Jackie Fielding. <laughs> she already has a book, though, so she's not going to win it. <laughs> this gentleman with tree pose, I'd say, he... He's in the run for, oh, not a good tree pose. You look very serene there. All right, great. Thank you. <laughs> so who was, uh, who, was there any consensus on who was, uh, I think it was between you and uh, that lady back there. All right, if you give me a card, <laughs> thank you. I'll give you a card. I only brought one, but <laughs> thank you, everyone, for indulging that. <laughs> so I'm also going to do another two-minute peer-to-peer break. Grab someone on your left or right, and two minutes to discuss how does Shortcrest or the International School of Brussels impact your thinking about learning space. Two minutes. <laughs> We're becoming an IB school, so I can see your 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 style of teaching would have to change, and the space would have to change to have your individual, your cross curricular, everything out. I mean, yeah, would you like to go to that school, that high school? Wow. I think uh, uh, I teach art at Perfect Center, and uh, we're going to be kind of revamping all those studio spaces. 
So I think the, the, the short crust idea, even though know, this is this is for uh, e scores, I think that would that would work very well with our you know, in our studio space. With facilitating independent studies. And what grades do you have? Eleven from twelve. Oh, okay. For real artists. <laughs> Wow. The other, other thing, well, the other thing I was thinking of throughout this whole presentation there is, you know, we don't have, I don't think we, we don't have very many cave spaces in my school, and there's got to be, a, we have this wonderful art gallery um, that would be a perfect place to create some, some cave spaces, and it, well, it's, it's, it's modular, you know. We have new walls and moves and stuff. Um, Do you think a high cave space would be the students when they can go home and have their safe space to study in, or just when they want to get away sometimes, or like, like you said, riding the bus or whatever, you, you're taking your own thinking and reflecting time? I'm trying to think about cave space. Kids can't make their own cave in the class and they're distracted so much. In middle school, I have middle school, they're real busy. <laughs> in sixth grade, so. But in a big public space. Yeah. That, that's the thing. It's not really a cave in the fact that it's hidden. Right. It still is open. Yeah. And I have cave spaces just in the stacks because you can kind of hide in the stacks. <laughs> but I always have to be watching to make sure they're doing their job and not keeping them up. So that kind of cave space is not really good. They have to be pretty disciplined to make their own cave space because you can do it anywhere. I mean, we can just tune out everybody in here and I can just focus on what I want to do. Okay, I know. I have your attention. That's my point. I can cave space. Oh, is my sound on? Hey, yeah. Um, you're in there. <laughs> All right, that was a lively one. I think everyone was ready for a break. Or maybe it was the yoga, I don't know. <laughs> Definitely an increased energy level. <coughs> so I have um, just a, a short case study here, really about Venture Academy, a new project. I'm going to just show a couple of slides about high school and <coughs> arts, too. Uh, and then we're going to see a, a four-minute animation about one of our new projects that's about to open in November. Um, we are really grateful to have the opportunity to nurture uh, an innovative network uh, right here in the Twin Cities. So I mentioned High School for Recording Arts already. We, we did some work with them 10 years ago. Uh, it's, a, it's an organization that I love when I go there. Sometimes I kind of feel like I'm home. There's something about it. Uh, it's that social-emotional connection. They create a sort of family there uh, that I think is, is unique and wonderful. Um, they are moving to a new space in Old Bally's, which you can see here on the map. And it's very close to here on University Avenue. And it's uh, right near a light rail stop, which I think is very significant. And they're about to open, well, we hope in a month. <laughs> All right. Um, and then we're also uh, the Architects for Venture Academy, which is over on University Avenue, but in the Minneapolis side. Uh, and that is a, a very innovative new middle and high school. This is their first year, so they're a startup. High School for Recording Arts has been around, oh, oh, 15 years now, right? So they're moving, and Venture Academy is brand new. And to us, because we, we get to be architects for both of you, we see some uh, possible similarities, and, and we're hoping that we're nurturing an innovation network. In fact, we just heard from the folks at Venture who were looking for someone to cook their food, uh, that there was a possibility that the food could be cooked <coughs> at High School for Recording Arts and uh, taken over there. And we thought, what a great idea. But I think there's much more potential than that. Uh, in fact, the people at Venture don't have any kind of performance space, any kind of recording studios. And yet, they're going to have some great maker spaces so what a terrific opportunity. And we know there's a lot of innovation uh, in the Twin Cities. And we're hoping to be a part of that. And we're hoping to nurture that. This photo happens to be oh, about 12 years ago. It's the first day I went to high school for recording arts. We hadn't done any construction. And I asked the kids what was important to them. 
and uh, they, uh, they posed for me. This is uh, David Ellis, the founder. Uh, at that point, they, they seemed to be talking about rap, although high school for recording out is about much more than rap. Um, this is from their old space, what we did about 10 years ago, uh, having a home base for each student was very significant. This is a group of students where about one third are homeless at any given time. A lot of them have been in the criminal justice system. A lot of them don't read well, have been expelled from other schools. So to come to a school where rather than being treated like in a lockdown situation, they're treated with a kind of respect as adults where you get your own workstation, I think is really significant and important. Um, gaining mastery through music, it's not a school devoted to creating a lot of sound engineers, and yet it is a school that really celebrates music and also the recording arts, and it is through that experience that those kids learn a lot of disciplines. So they're much more likely to learn how to use Excel if they're working on a business plan that's associated with the music industry, for example. Oops, I got a little <laughs> rotation there. Just imagine that that was that way. <laughs> Lewis is laughing. This is one of uh, a rendering that he and I worked on. Uh, this is the front of their new building, and uh, most of that construction is existing. We added the sign and some of those banners there. Uh, and anyone wants to donate, we're looking for a donor to help pay for those banners. Uh, that will open soon, and I think it's going to be a fantastic celebration. It's going to be a real center for, uh, for learning and also for recording in the Twin Cities. And we're doing new sound studios, which will be some of the best sound studios in all of the Twin Cities. So you can see, uh, this, is the, this is a first, it's a cutaway drawing, this is the first floor. It used to be a large gym. We now have a medium-sized gym, and these are sound studios. You see those odd different sizes, which is good for, uh, for music. Uh, for residents. And then this is the upstairs where you see this is a series of advisories. And each of those advisory spaces for about 20 students has a glass overhead door uh, opening into this common area which is collaborative and for performance and with a portable stage as well. Uh, and here are some preliminary thoughts about the kind of graffiti walls which will create identity inside. So this is a school I know you're going to hear about, you're going to want to visit, and I hope you can support in some way and be a part of their innovation network. Venture Academy. Uh, this is a, uh, I thought would be relevant to you because it's a very low cost renovation. It is, it's along University Avenue. It's a one story commercial building. Nothing special about this building. And because it's a startup charter school, we had to develop uh, phase one, phase two, uh, phase three. I think it was there are four phases, right? <laughs> It starts out as a uh, 110 sixth graders in year one, and, and then by year seven, you have 310 sixth to 12th graders. So we had to work out an arrangement with a landlord that we had space that we could grow into, uh, and we wanted to create a common area that could grow through all those phases. Uh, so there was some complexity in working that out. Um, very low class. Uh, cost fast rehab. We just got a lease with a landlord a few months ago. We're in construction now, and they're going to open in a month. Um, and one thing you'll notice is that there are no real classrooms. There is a West Learning Community, uh, and there is an East Learning Community, uh, and there are some maker spaces, and there's a, there's a movement studio, uh, there's a seminar room, and an office. So very different model than the traditional school. And what we, this is actually not their kids, but yeah, let's put together some images to give us a sense of what it might be like. Uh, what we've done is tried to figure out, a diagram what a day in the life would be like for a trailblazer. That's what they call their students. Um, so that we can look at that space, a very small space, and see how it's gonna work for them through the day. So period one, 8 a.m., a town meeting. Activities include role playing, improvisation, challenges, media clips, outside speakers. This sounds like your group, <laughs> not the traditional uh, uh, school group. Very learner led. And so you can see we've identified the space for that. And we've actually worked out you know, how many tables there are, how many chairs, how is that going to work. And of course, these are movable chairs. So there's lots of different ways you can use it. Uh, 
town meeting. This happens to be a picture from one of our, we have four projects in Vancouver, British Columbia, and this is one of our uh, new elementary schools, and you can see a town meeting at the beginning of the day. Period two, 8.30 to 10 a.m., language in the written word. Activities include book clubs, Socratic seminars, writing projects, discussions. That reminds me of a little story, uh, speaking of reading and writing. When High School for Recording Arts was founded, it was founded out of a small recording studio in St. Paul. And I understand David Ellis called up his mentor, uh, Dr. Wayne Jennings. And the story, as I heard it, Wayne, is that the first aspect of the curriculum was kids had to read one story in a newspaper each day. Is that right? And I love that one story. One local and one national. Yeah. One local and one, so two stories. So oh, good, I learned something. <laughs> the story gets juicier. I love that story because the idea of this focus on literacy is universal around the world. We, we can't just talk about collaboration and innovation and forget about the importance of literacy. Uh, but there's a lot of ways it can be done. Just having <coughs> kids read one local and one national story every day in the newspaper can actually anchor a literacy program. And here they are anchoring their literacy program, but they're doing it without classrooms. And I'm convinced that Venture is going to have a terrific success. They have an excellent program. So now, period two, uh, you can see uh, where they're working. They're using the West Learning Community and the East one. And each student has their own desk, but the desks are connected. So it's collaborative, but it's also individual. Uh, period two, language and the written word. Learning to know. Uh, Period three, 10 a.m. to noon. Activities include independent learning, one-to-one, -one, small group coaching. And you can see where that happens. It happens in the West Learning Community. It also happens in these small collaborative areas. So we also have, it's not a classroom, but it's a small seminar-sized rooms. And we change the furniture. Instead of these kind of uh, collaborative desks, you have more watering hole kind of mold, more, more like the area over there places to gather. This is something you can easily do just through furniture settings. Period three, learning to know, learning to do. Another example of how that might look, International School of Brussels. Period four, games and free time. Uh, Play-based learning is important. Yoga, dance, outdoor play, basketball, indoor games. They don't have a gym, but they're still accommodating that. And we'll be using both the commons by moving the furniture out of the way and also this movement studio over here. This happens to be from, high, uh, from Cristo Rey, uh, where you're seeing step dancing in the Agora. So you don't, even if you don't have a gym, you can still program play. Period five is maker time, robotics, Lego, science Olympiad, maker fair, fundamentals of computer science, STEM, and you can see the areas we've developed for that over here. Uh, you have a STEM lab, you actually have a wood shop, uh, a computer lab, and an art lab, all interconnected. You can see a little bit, one example of maker time. Um, so from there, uh, middle school, I'm gonna go to now a new, new building. Um, one of our newest projects, it's a series of Three charter schools, all in the works in San Antonio, part of a network where they're planning to have 100 charter schools, Inspire Academies. And I think I might have to get out of this to, uh, let's see. Find the, uh, find the link. Let's see if this works. give you an example of a new school, uh, purpose built, and we can see we're coming in towards the entry. Uh, that would be the administrative area there and welcoming area. And here's a deck where you enter the school. And notice how you can see right through it. So that kind of transparency is important. When we have the opportunity to design from scratch, we can take into account all those design patterns uh, that are possible. And so here you see right through the school. And also we're using some local materials. These, this is limestone uh, right from the San Antonio area. And now you see the sense of signature, this focus on Anne Frank. It's a middle school. So we're celebrating 
uh, her as an exemplar in that case. And here you see this is a teacher collaboration space. Uh, on the left, where there are, there are no classrooms, by the way, in this building. But those teachers are in a central location. They're very available to students. They can, they can collaborate together. And they also can see out on this learning commons. And if you look at this signature element, it looks a bit like a hearth or a fireplace. They're actually what we call tree cookies. They're trees from the site. This is an old farm site where we cut the, slice the trees and put them up to, so that we're uh, reflecting what was there and we're creating uh, a sense of signature. And that's a media bar on the left there. And you can see the high tables to perch on. And then right around the corner is a place where we can control the sound. So they can actually do video recording and sound recording in a little media center outside. And then over here on the right is a connection to a screen porch. Can I ask you a quick question? Please. Um. <laughs> What is kind of like your maximum population that you see these facilities being most effective? Uh, we haven't discovered the maximum yet, but we have a rule of 150. And that's based on about 45 years of uh, research in anthropology on how people as human beings work together in groups. Robin Dunbar is probably best known uh, for that research, but it, it's come from many different places. And that is that people tend to feel most comfortable and when they also feel secure, they're able, most able to learn when they're in an environment of 150 or less where everyone knows your name. And so what we'll do at large schools is break them up into learning communities of 150 or less. So for example, we have some schools which are 1,500 students, but it looks like small, either small buildings are broken up into different floors. Interestingly, uh, I did a little consulting for uh, Albuquerque Public Schools some years ago. And they did a study on learning communities and found when you got to 180, you lost all benefits from having it. So there is a maximum number. And talking to and anecdotal research, action research, I've talked to a lot of principals who said, ah, somewhere around 110, 130 is a sweet spot. Now, we do have schools where they'll push it to 180 because they, you know, they're, they're, they need to because of the budget. And that often begins to you know, create some difficulties and tensions about how you operate. I'm just wondering, one of the biggest concerns that we have at a public school is being able to have access to, like you have a media bar and have this, I mean, you gotta realize how much technology you have in, in your population. So even if you had houses of schools, being able to use the technology, the, the labs, and all those things like that. So. This is trying to the house, is, house idea can be very similar to the learning community idea that I'm talking about. And if you can keep those houses to 150 or less, and then some duplication of resources. So every house ought to have some mm -hmm. kind of uh, kitchen-like space. Doesn't need to be a full kitchen, yeah. but a place you know, for water and some uh, cabinets where you could uh, watering hole-like space and comfortable seating. Uh, and if possible, a media bar. But you know, the cost to do a media bar can be pretty uh, modest, right? Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it could be an old bar you pulled out of your parents' 50s basement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. When you mentioned the, you were talking about Dunbar's number of 150. Um, the, so you have a school, like uh, I think it was the Brussels School was for 1,500. So right. do you, do you, you repeat the question? Oh, oh, sure. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll use my teacher voice. So the question was, I, I'm wondering about when you have a school like the international school that, where the population was 1,500, then do you break it into houses? Is that the approach? To learning communities of 150, yeah. exactly. So in the high school that we, uh, from International School of Brussels, where you, you saw that temporary building, that was on three floors. And actually, the learning communities were simply developed into one on each floor. And each floor was set up for about 150. And they had, uh, based on their prior experience, thought they were really only going to be able to get about 100 students per floor based on the way they were used to teaching in terms of their uh, classrooms. But they were able to get 150. And it was partly because of the fluidity of the spaces and the change to the program. 
Well, I'm just going to finish this animation and take a few minutes, and then we'll have a few more questions. Yeah. Or go ahead. As a high school teacher uh, that taught at a public school and now at a charter school, we have the standard five, seven periods a day that doesn't even seem to fit for this model. I mean, I'm trying to, I'm, this is so beautiful, and the fact that you can do that. But I mean, this is looking at this type of architecture is also asking for a different type of teaching that is not present in a lot of schools right now. So therefore, is your company and these schools catering to only that scenario? Or like, how could you bring this to your standard public school where we have five period, 80 minute classes a day, you're stuck in a classroom, you have no fluidity. So I think this is amazing. I think this is absolutely beautiful. It's what part of me is thinking, I've taught in different states too and abroad, and I haven't seen this yet. So what, what, can, you, how, what can you give me to help me go back to my administration who is currently school and say, hey, these are really great ideas that I saw. How can we fit this into our kind of rigid standard schooling method that my school and then most public high schools are doing? Well, those are great questions, and we're hearing those <coughs> questions uh, all around the world, and we do have many more traditional public school clients. Uh, for example, we've got, I think, five clients in Cleveland, Ohio, <laughs> and now uh, we've just completed three schools in Regina, Saskatchewan, which is a you know, public school district, or in Vancouver, British Columbia, that all have traditional uh, learning approaches. And there's not one answer to that. One thing is that professional development is important through this, and actually our company does offer coaching professional development and curriculum development, and we do it concurrently with the visioning process. If you look about what's, if you think about what's important in change management, change management 101, you have to agree on a shared vision. So you really need to start with a discussion about teaching and learning. And if in fact you agree that you need more learner-led, more student-directed type learning, that that's important, if you acknowledge that that's important in our world today, that's a place to start. If you need more personalized learning environments, you might be and there are different ways to reach administrations. They may be reached through Howard Gardner's multiple intelligences, or they may be reached through a presentation on 20 learning modalities. We do many of these. So we usually start out with sharing a best practice in teaching and learning around the world. And we do it with, uh, from conservative districts to some of the most liberal districts you ever uh, heard about. Uh, Lewis and I had a WebEx yesterday with futurists in Mallorca who want to launch a new uh, K-12 thousand student IB school. And they had read 150 books. <laughs> totally all about the future. They were easy, you know, they were right. We want all of that. But uh, we have the opposite in, uh, in Cleveland right now with some of the schools we're working at. You know, where they're, um, so that whole range is there. At the very most basic level, what we've seen works well is to allow two teachers who were in isolated classrooms with a wall between them to collaborate. It's a buddy system. They get that. And you'll, uh, you'll see it in some schools, right, in Minneapolis public schools. Uh, for example, at Clara Barton, I was over there, uh, Clara Bar Barton Oper Open School, they had gotten the maintenance staff to go in and put an opening between two classrooms because there was two teachers who liked to collaborate. <laughs> And they just had this archway. There wasn't even a door there <laughs> between them. Now, it's best what we'll do is we'll create spaces where there might be double doors with a sound seal around it. Or we might uh, you know, do a sliding door. Uh, allow two teachers to collaborate. It makes a huge difference when, when we can start working together. That's at the simplest level. Then the next level is to say, can we get four to seven teachers to collaborate with 120 to 150 students? Now that means some more architectural changes, but if you're working with a traditional district, we were working with a district in Cleveland where we said, we can actually improve your utilization rate, numbers, they heard that, from 80% to 100% by going to a learning community model. You're, you're gonna have a 20% improvement in efficiency, and how do we do it? We said, instead of having every teacher have 100% ownership in a 900 square foot new classroom, we're going to give you teacher collaboration rooms where they have their stuff there, but sometimes there's some sharing between those classrooms. There's moving around. So we're programming those spaces a little differently. It's still a, a traditional class period mode. Actually, that particular school, there were some other elements like they have. It's another Cristo Ray school in the Cristo Ray network where all the kids at high school are out one day a week at a job. 
So we thought the day we're out, we're going to program them in, and we're going to take advantage of that classroom. Now, if teachers had their desks in a classroom, you can't get better than about an 80% utilization rate. But we were able to show them how we could use the common areas, reduce the amount of circulation, and use their program, which had them out some, sometimes in the community, and improve it. Now, at an elementary school, sometimes it's moving, using more outdoor space and those common areas vigorously. And often, administration and teachers are a little resistant. I want my own classroom all the time. And we say, well, what if you're in a suite of spaces where you get to share that classroom with one other person? Uh, you can put your stuff up on the walls, and most of the time you can have it. But there's sometimes you meet every week, and you talk about the fact that uh, someone else may be using part of that part of the time. But you also have these common areas in small group rooms and learning terraces. So you, you work through that. I'm just going to share a little bit more of this animation and then we'll finish up with, uh, I'm, I'm running over my time, uh, with just a, a little, some final questions. And uh, we'll go on to the rest of the agenda. Um, so you see the screen porch because of the uh, because of those fans we saw there. Ah, thank you. Uh, we're able to expand the use of that space much longer, even without air conditioning, and that's important. Now here we are. We're in the cafe space, which is a lot like a Starbucks. common area there on your right. And notice something in the middle of the common area. I uh, see my, my cursor. This is something we call the trading post. This is a really interesting uh, element. It's important because you see common areas in houses or learning communities all over North America, which are not well used. A lot of you are familiar with the 1980s middle school pod movement. So you created these pods with these big common areas, but not all teachers know how to use a big space well. It can be challenging. If you're a theater designer and familiar with stage sets, or maybe you're an architect, you could be pretty good at using a big space, but for teachers it's tough. So this trading post is a movable element that has on this side a kind of collaborative space, soft seating, and on this side, bookshelves. And what's great about it is that it divides that space into really two or even four different zones that are a little bit more classroom-like. People's comfort zone. So you ask that question, how do we, how do we <coughs> go from a classroom model, 45 minute periods, to a model like this? Well, we show them how you can still have two to four zones that are much like classrooms, but they needed a space divider. And we have special acoustical absorption above on this side uh, and in the ceiling in order to make sure that it's not too loud, even though they don't have walls. Huge change. Now, but what's nice that it's temporary is we can also move that out. It's on wheels. And we can have uh, a community or student performance or gathering for 250 people in that same space. So the flexibility is so important. It allows us to get to those issues of more <coughs> traditional or more progressive. But here you can see the bookshelf side. And then you can see that nest up above, which is a cave space. And uh, now you can see a maker space, or what we call the Vinci Studios, where support both science and math, which is important because not all schools can afford both science and math labs, particularly at an elementary school level. That's not, this happens to be a middle school. So that space, which was interdisciplinary, which would support both science, math, and invention, was very important. Now we're zeroing in on that nest. That wood is from recycled materials, an old barn. Uh, right on the site. And you can see this space is cozy and yet you're connected. So it's cozy and yet it's also safe. It's visually supervisable while having that sense of cave space that so many of us uh, enjoy and benefit from. This 
This space is a learning suite, two learning studios, one there and one there with a movable wall. And we actually created that step seating inside of a sort of soft furnishing element. So it's flexible. So you can either have two smaller areas or opened up to one big lecture space. Everything in the school is naturally lit. Every space is lit with daylight. Daylight and has strong connections to the outside. You can see the use of color. Um, how we have, it's a version of red. In some cases we do have white. This is a yoga and Pilates studio. And now you see the strong use of the outside. It's actually quite a small site. And there's two other schools which are about to start construction right next to it. Um, and you can see there's a, we've actually planted a garden which will attract butterflies. So this is a butterfly garden. And we've dealt with the, the marshy areas to, uh, with this bridge. And so there's a rainwater lab out there. Uh, that's the high school on the right, which is just finishing design. So with that, I'm done with that part of the presentation. I'm sorry I've gone a little over on time. Maybe we can take a few minutes uh, for any more Q&A or discussion. And then I'll turn it over to Carl and Scott again. Uh, any more? Yeah. <laughs> we seem to be in a current obsession with school security. How, how do your designs address that? How do we address school security? in your design that, that, you know, the public pressure seems to be that you need to be able to have a fortress. All right, well, great question about school security. Um, I, I like to start with some of the, uh, the most important principles in research that come out in the last 40 years. And for that, I go to 1967, Jane Jacobs, a great urbanist who wrote a book called The Death and Life of the Great American City. And I grew up uh, in Long Island, outside of New York, and I, I uh, lived through urban renewal. And the urban renewal movement in the United States created the most dangerous places in the world. Uh, you even went so far as in St. Louis to literally dynamite the public housing projects. They were so dangerous. But all over the country, there were destructive urban renewal movements. And essentially, they were a more fortress approach and high-rise approach to design. And what when Jane Jacobs was writing in the 60s, uh, at that time, uh, well, shortly after that, Minneapolis was called Murderopolis at one point. <laughs> and New York was one of the most dangerous places in the entire world. Where was it most dangerous? It was in the public housing projects. And what they had done was take small, some, sometimes dilapidated, two, three, four, five-story brick buildings with wood porches out front on the street where people were hanging out all the time. I knew about it. I used to do electrical repair work in the summer when I was in college. And I worked in Harlem, Spanish Harlem. I never found it dangerous. People were out on the street. Uh, I'd say, hi, electricita. And they were always happy to see me. It was not a dangerous environment where people were hanging out. Now, they replaced those with high-rise buildings where the first floor had no people uh, in them. What did you have? Elevator cores, mechanical rooms, and there, there weren't even any bathrooms. So people living upstairs, uh, if kids were outside, they would just piss outside, right on the street or against the building, because they weren't going to go in an elevator up. And people did not want to use the elevators and stairs, because they were the most dangerous places possible. No visibility. They destroyed the American uh, fabric uh, all over through designed for security, bunker-like. And these were, these were buildings that, out of concrete and steel that were very secure. And many of them even had security systems, which are usually bypassed. A lot of those buildings still belong to different gangs and are still amongst the most dangerous buildings in the world. So her principle was the thing that makes spaces safe is eyes on the street. So if you think about that video we just saw, the administrative area and the teacher collaboration area have this incredible visual surveillance of everything. Everything has adult eyes on it. Now the second thing is that where people know each other and they can see what's going on, this sense of learning community, as Dunbar's research, they take a sense of responsibility in that turf. So going back to New York again in the late 60s, 
some of you might remember there was all this press about a murder that happened with 150 people watching and no one called it in. Well, it was such a big place, it wasn't a learning community, it was so anonymous that everyone assumed someone else would call it in, right? They had no personal connection or territory. Connect. They didn't own their turf. When you have a school of 1,000 students or even 600 students, no one feels they own that space. They're a cog in the wheel. When you have a group of 75, 100, 125, maybe up to 150, in inter a suite of interconnected spaces where we can see each other, we get to know each other as individuals, the adults and students. Students have relationships not with just one adult, but with five adults. And someone doesn't show in, um, so John doesn't come in one morning uh, for that first group morning advisory meeting. Someone will know, oh, well, his grandmother died, or he's, he's feeling bad, or maybe we better give him a call. There's that sense of connectedness. This is the most important thing in safety we've seen over and over again. Now, the other elements that uh, you're, you're seeing, uh, many of which can be taken care of uh, with technology. So video cameras are cheap. They're a good thing. <laughs> Go ahead, put them in. It's easy. It reduces the amount of crime dramatically just seeing them there. <laughs> if people know that they're being recorded. Um, and, you know, of course, we can deal with these drop-down shutters as well. Uh, but the biggest principles are the ones I mentioned. Feeling a sense of turf, feeling a sense of connections, and also having that visual uh, surveillance and connections. Any other questions or comments? Well, thank you. Uh, it's just been delightful to get to know you a little bit.